think we can start. So it's a pleasure to have Sim Simon King, King or Simon King for the Americans <laughs> now uh, with us. And he, he did a lot of work about category stuff and arithmetic operation with basic framework in place. So we will we'll be having me as a speaker as an expert on the field. Yeah, thank you very much, and thank you very much to, uh, yeah, for giving me the opportunity to tell something here, even though I do not point, uh, count points. Um, yeah, and this is not so much about category framework. I mean, you said something about category, but so what is the scenario of this tutorial? Um, yeah, suppose you are algebras or want to construct a ring or anything fancy like this. Yeah, and then of course you have the problem how to do arithmetics with the things that you just implemented. Um, the easiest problem is uh, how to, say, multiply or add elements of one fixed ring. So this will be the first part of this talk. Um, in some cases it makes sense to convert uh, elements of, say, different rings into each other. For example, if you have a, a matrix over the integers, and you can as well represent it as a matrix over the rationals. So how to do such conversions, how to implement it? Um, a bit more complicated it becomes if, uh, yeah, if you think about uh, polynomials with integral uh, coefficients, and now you want to add a rational number to it. So these are first uh, totally different uh, things, a rational number and a polynomial over the integers. What should be the result? Well, apparently you would say it should be a polynomial over the rationals. But how can we teach Sage to do those things automatically? How to find a new uh, ring uh, that fits the result? So this will be the first part. Um, and of course, uh, there's a module or anything like this. Uh, you have an action. And you can think of more general situations where you have an action and uh, yeah, how to implement this. I mean, there's a fairly general framework for all this. Um, and I mentioned a conversion, but there's actually a related notion of a coercion. A coercion happens automatically, and of course, uh, it can only happen automatically if there's some mathematical reason behind. You would not be allowed to do any conversion that you like, uh, simply happen automatically. Uh, so what is the mathematics behind? Um, yeah, and in this tutorial I present an example. I simply pretend that I found a very fancy new way of uh, representing matrices. Uh, well, it isn't fancy at all, but simply I pretend. Um, so I want to implement matrix spaces, give a new version of matrix spaces. Of course, uh, matrix already exists in stage. Um, then want to show how to, yeah, how to fit the new stuff into the existing framework. I mean, there is a lot of stuff in Sage, and if you implement a new algebraic structure or a new ring, then you would like to make use of the existing stuff as well. So how to fit the new things into the existing? <coughs> yeah, and we'll go through it step by step. So, um, arithmetics within one parent. First of all, I need to tell what is a parent. Um, as I mentioned, it, this is not a talk about, say, just category framework, but uh, to explain things here, we will need some notions from category theory. Um, a parent is an object uh, in some category, and it contains elements. So, in other words, a parent is, in the first place, a set. And typically, it provides additional arithmetic properties. For example, it can be a ring, and you have multiplication of the elements, can be a uh, vector space, then you have in addition some uh, operation of, of a field of coefficients and so on. Um, yeah, and Sage provides convenient base classes for a couple of uh, types of parents, modules, say, and uh, they should be used. I mean, it simply makes sense to use the existing stuff there. But in addition, Sage provides a category framework, and this is a funny thing, because using the base classes, we have seen the introduction of on Python classes, also, using the base class, it is one thing, but uh, it's sometimes it is difficult to capture all mathematical properties with these base classes. Um, we will see an example here. In the category framework, lets you make use of additional stuff that yeah, is provided by the math mathematical structure, but not necessarily by the base class you started with. 
So, um, in our example, we're going to construct the space or the set of all matrices, n by n matrices, over a given base ring. Um, okay, so these sets are in the first place modules. You can add matrices of the same shape. Um, you can multiply them with scalars, but you are not necessarily able to multiply the matrices by themselves because they are not square. Um, so, it is just a module, in other words, we start with the, the base class of modules. It is defined in, uh, here in sage.modules.module, and then it is called capital module. And we will uh, refine this class uh, also by using the category framework, namely, if it happens to be about square matrices, then we tell, okay, it's an algebra. Um, for the elements, we have a problem because, uh, some technical problem, because uh, there is a base class for module elements. But if you want to uh, multiply one module element with another element of the same module, then for some reason, say, it chose to raise an error. This is, of course, bad if we want to implement a ring. Okay, so. Uh, we start with the base class for ring elements, even though in some cases we will not have uh, multiplication. So this is a little shortcoming of the whole thing. So here's the basic code we start with. It will be refined later. So what is happening here? Um, first of all, I, uh, I import some base classes. So this is about <coughs> the matrix space. To distinguish it from the existing matrix spaces in Sage, I call it differently. Uh, as I said, we inherit from the modules, even though sometimes it is a ring. Yeah, and first of all, the uh, yeah the ring of coefficients should not be just a ring, but it should be a commutative ring. I mean, so this is uh, an example how to test whether something is a commutative ring. Simply create a category of commutative rings and ask if B is in this category. Well, if it is not, then we raise a value error because we want to work over community ring. So and then we have uh, yeah, the number of rows and the number of columns stored in some attribute. Um, and now um, there's a problem again with uh, not properly, use, uh, properly using the category framework. Uh, the base class of modules does not accept an argument telling the category. Um, this is a bug, maybe it should be fixed this week, maybe. And, in, uh, and so therefore, I will not use module in it, but parent in it, because there I can tell the category. So, how is this category found? If we have square matrices, um, well, it, and then it is an algebra, an algebra over this given base ring. If it is a one by one matrix, then it is even commutative algebra. So I can just put this here, and otherwise it is just a module. Okay. So then there are some typical um, some typical methods one uh, expects from matrix spaces, namely one method telling the number of rows, one telling the number of columns. Here's a string representation. Um, yeah, Volker talked about uh, some magical Python methods. String representation is usually done by a double underscore representation, also R-E-P-R -E method. You see here, I only use a single underscore, and this is something that often happens in Sage. Uh, there are default implementations for these mathematical types of Python methods, and it is often a good idea not to overload these uh, standard, uh, these default implementations. Uh, often, you have a single underscore method of the same name um, in which you implement this functionality. So for comparison, uh, well, when are two, uh, two matrix spaces equal? Of course, uh, well, here we, we test whether they are of the same class. Um, then we test if the number of rows is the same, or if the number of columns is the same, and if the base rings are the same. And if all this is the same, then they are equal. Okay, so evaluate it. Um, okay, so. so for the elements, Again, we have some initial initialization. We store the di data. Well, I said I pretend it is a very fancy new uh, implementation for matrix matrices. Well, in fact, I simply store it as list of rows. So very simple, very good. So don't mind about the data structure. Um, they are ring elements, and of course, one uh, needs to, yeah, to cover at some point the initialization of ring elements. One 
that simply needs to tell in what parent structure is this element. Here's an, again a single underscore representation method. And here something that I need later. Here's an, <coughs> a method that implements iteration. So this is another magical Python method. And this is okay to override it. Um, it iterates uh, over the rows of this matrix. So this behaves the same as uh, what the usual uh, sage matrices do. And here another magical Python method, get item. It makes uh, it provides access uh, to the matrix elements. Okay, I could also implement set item in this way. You could set uh, particular uh, marks on in, the, in this matrix. But don't mind about this. I simply want to uh, get the, the items. Okay. So in the first lesson of this lecture is uh, using the category framework to create elements is easy. Okay, and this is more or less the only thing that I. Uh, want to further mention about the category framework. Um, well, I just have implemented uh, a class for the elements of our matrix space. You might think that we will use this class directly, but in fact, this is a bad idea. Better it is to assign an attribute called element, capital element, to, uh, to the matrix space or to the class of this matrix space, and then we create some of these uh, matrix spaces, and then the category framework automatically turns this class that we implemented and mixes in further features that come from the category of this thing. So this is an algebra, and uh, yeah, and this element class that we have here is uh, uh, is not equal to the class that I just implemented. So this is a different class, but it is a subclass of this. And something that I forgot to mention, and it uh, should then be also a subclass of uh, of uh, a second, of something that is provided by the category. So can be MS category, and then it also has an element class. Of course, this element class does not know at all about matrices, but it knows about algebra elements. So. And in other words, we have here a class that both knows about algebra elements and about matrices. And we should use this to create, uh, create elements. But in fact, we don't need to care so much at this point, because again, by some default implementations in Sage, uh, the creation of the elements is quite automatic. We have our parent, mat uh, also the matrix space MS. We give it some data, namely here a list of lists. And it automatically turns this into an, uh, into an instance of the element class. So here you see the print method works. It is an instance of uh, the element class. And the parent of it is this matrix space. So in other words, the element knows that it belongs to this matrix space. And simply to demonstrate uh, the get item method that I did it correctly, there's slicing like in the case of lists. So this is how to implement it. Um, yeah, and now we come to the uh, arithmetic methods. So, so far I simply said a matrix is something that we can print, but we cannot do any arithmetic with it. Again, there are uh, certain metrical Python methods. Double underscore mul, for example, is for the multiplication. So let's see how it, is, uh, how it looks like. Here is the source code. I simply skipped the, the documentation of it to make it better legible. So multiplication takes uh, two arguments, left and right, and if uh, and the default implementation does the following. If both live in the same parent, then there's either some i multiplication, I'm not talking about this, or it will uh, let uh, this method do the real work. So this is a single underscore multiplication method. So you would implement the single underscore multiplication method and simply leave the double underscore multiplication method as it is. Um, yeah, if uh, if they do not belong to the same ring, but if it happens to be an integer, then it is try to return this. Well, if it does not work, then uh, the next thing is tried. And in the very end, there is a coercion model involved, and yeah, the main part of this talk will be about this coercion model. So the second lesson of this lecture is do not override this, these double underscore methods. 
neither multiplication nor addition nor, sub nor, uh, nor subtraction, uh, subtraction, also not calling something, uh, because there are reasonable default implementations and it has consequences if you overload them. So for string representation, you would have single underscore retro method for multiplication, single underscore multiplication method, addition, subtraction, and so on. And uh, we are have modules here. If you have a module structure, then you should implement rmul single underscore or lmul single underscore uh, yeah, methods. And there are some guarantees that come from Sage's coercion model. If you implement this single underscore mul method, also add and sub and so on, then you can assume that both arguments belong to the same parent. So the idea is, if they do not belong to the same parent and you want to do some addition, then the coercion model would first push them to the same parent. And if they are in the same parent, then uh, only in this case would be uh, called this single underscore mul method. And uh, also in this, uh, in the case of, of a yeah, module structure, you can always assume that the first argument, of course, belongs to this parent, and the second argument belongs to the base ring. So, in other words, belongs to the ring that acts. Okay, so we refine the code. Um, this is a bit nasty. Well, I uh, create a new class that inherits from a class that has the same name. Okay, Python allows you to do it. I don't want to always invent new names, so it works. Um, so I implement a single underscore addition method. Well, here it looks like. And a multiplication method. We assume here that self and other have the same parents, so it's no problem. Um, this is only multiplication for square matrices. And yeah, so this is the implementation. Uh, the implementation, I guess, does not matter, but it works. Okay, so I recreate this matrix space. Of course, I've changed the element class. I need to reassign it. Um, create, again, a matrix space and two matrices. Now I can do the addition and also the multiplication because they are square matrices. Let's check that if the result is correct. Let's do the <coughs> same with Sage's own matrices. And the multiplication says, okay, that's the same. You see the different uh, string representation. So it is in this talk always possible to distinguish between our implementation and Sage's implementation. The result is the same. But multiplication with base ring elements does not work yet. So, in other words, we need to provide the lmul and rmul single underscore methods. Okay, easy implementation. Simply multiply item for item. Item, refresh everything, and now we also have a multiplication with the scalars. Okay, so this was about the ring, respectively, the module structure, how to implement it. Um, and the second part will be about conversions and coercions between two parts. So, first, what is a conversion? A conversion is a very uh, general notion. It simply is any procedure that takes data and returns an element of the power or raises an error. It's not necessary that it will convert any data, just some data. Um, the notation for this is, uh, so uh, in the user interface, you would have the parent, and then call the parent with some uh, arguments for the data I was mentioning here. Um, so this is not implemented yet. So it gives a phrase um, And uh, I mentioned it before that the default of this, uh, yeah, of this call here, the default would simply take the argument and pass it to the element class. But our element class does not know what to do with an integer. It only knows about lists of lists. So of course we could change the initialization method of our matrix implementation such that it ac accepts not only lists of lists but also integers. This would be one possibility. But I think a better way is to pro provide a method of the parent, so not of the element, but of the parent, uh, that is called element constructor, single underscore again. Yeah, and if you implement this method, then you will have further conversions. So do it here. You should not override the magical Python method again, but should provide the element constructor. So here it is. So what is happening here? Um, I have the method element constructor takes some data 
if the data is nothing, then we uh, assume that you want the zero matrix. So we take the zero of this, uh, this base ring. And if uh, the data is just one number, just one number that can be interpreted in, uh, in, the, in this uh, base ring, then we create the diagonal matrix. So this is how it can be written. And otherwise, then we rely on the initialization method of our element class, simply pass the data to the element class. So I think I have evaluated it. So, and we recreate matrix space and have uh, just checked that uh, conversion of lists still works. And in addition, we now can create diagonal matrices simply by keeping yeah, integers as data. And maybe surprisingly, but we are also able to convert the usual sage matrices into our matrix space. Why is this? Well, the in initialization method of my matrix expects, well, I said lists of lists, but in fact what it expects is iterables of iterables. Okay, and if you iterate over a matrix, then it iterates over the rows, and the rows themselves iterate over their elements. So it is technically, in a way, like a list of lists. In other words, our constructor knows what to do. So it can convert a sage matrix into <coughs> our matrix. So this was about conversion, how to implement conversion, single underscore element uh, constructor. A coercion is a bit more, because the coercion happens automatically. So sage would say, this conversion is mathematically sober, I can apply it whenever I want. Of course, this mathematically sober is uh, something that needs to be taken with care. But in our example here, um, well, if we try to, to add our implementation of a matrix with Sage's implementation of a matrix, then it gives an error. Of course, mathematically, it would make sense. It is simply two different implementations of the same arithmetic structure. So it totally makes sense to allow this addition, but how to make this happen? Um, so what should happen here is that the Sage matrix is converted into an element of our matrix space. So then we have two matrices in our matrix space, and then we can do the addition. So how to teach Sage to do this uh, conversion automatically? And why should we teach it? Well, uh, I said it is mathematically sober or reasonable, and uh, the underlying notion is this. So assume we have three parts, P1, P2, and P3. First of all, our coercion, phi from P1 to P2, is a morphism in an appropriate category that contains both P1 and P2 as objects. So it is a morphism in a category. That's an important different, uh, uh, difference. A, co a conversion can be anything. Conversion is not structure preserving. It's, uh, for example, you can convert a floating point into an integer simply by cutting off the, the decimals. So this is not structure preserving, but a coercion must be structure preserving. And also, there must be at most one coercion from P1 to P2, and if it exists, then conversion should do the same thing, in order to not confuse conversion and coercion. And we, of course, want that the identity morphism is a coercion, and we also want that it is transitive. So if we have a coercion from P1 to P2, the coercion from P2 to P3, then the composition, first phi and then psi, is again a coercion from P1 to P3. Well, there's uniqueness, in other words, it is the coercion from P1 to P3. So these are axioms that need to be satisfied by Sage's uh, coercion framework. It is, of course, difficult to prove that it really satisfies these axioms. If it doesn't, then it is a bug. Okay? So if you find any situation where this does not hold, then please open a ticket. So, coercions will implicitly be used in arithmetic operations. Um, here's some, uh, some warning, um, maybe some shortcoming. It may very well be that P1 is an additive group and P2 is a ring. So, uh, maybe that you can coerce P1 into so the additive group into the ring. In the ring, you can do multiplication. And because there is coercion of this additive thing into a ring, you would then be able to multiply an element of the additive group with a ring element. So this may be something that you would not want to happen, 
Um, yeah, so far uh, the coercion framework of Sage would not distinguish between these uh, categories. Uh, so if there is a coercion, then it will be used for any arithmetical coercion. So what if we have a coercion in both directions? This, this happens, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so how does Sage decide which one to use? Uh, well, I did not show how how this really works in arithmetic operations. But if it uh, exists in both directions, then you always have a left and a right uh, operand of your thing, and it will always go to the left if both directions work. Okay. If only one direction works, then it's okay what to do. And if no direction works, then it tries to find a common power into which to push both. Mm -hmm. What is an example of that? Huh? Of something going both ways? Ah, well, yeah. that's, uh, for example, you have uh, domestic functions. And there are different uh, bases or different representations mm -hmm. of uh, this. And there are always conversions, uh, coercions in both directions. I mean, these are conversions in the first place, but it is, of course, more efficient and so on. And uh, yeah, so you have it in both directions. Or something that we could do as, as well here. You have made it polynomials uh, being defined using Flint and polynomials being defined by something else, then still uh, there are coercions in both directions. So, um, back to our example. So, we see that there is a converge map. So, at this point, Sage knows there is a converge map from Sage's matrix space to our corresponding matrix space. So, this is a conversion map, not a coercion yet. Uh, if we ask if it has a coercion, then it says false. But surprisingly, Sage does know that there should be a coercion from the bring of integers to our matrix space. Why is that? Well, this is another benefit of the category framework. If you initialize something in the category of algebras, then it knows that there should all, uh, well, all algebras in, in Sage are unitary, so there is a one element. And so there is always a coercion from the base ring into the algebra. Okay, so this is this coercion here. There should be some generic morphism leading from the uh, base ring into our matrix space, over this base ring. And I said uh, coercion is transitive. Of course, Sage knows there is a coercion from the integers into the rational field. So when you put composing. Um, so there is a coercion. Or oh, the Sage assumes there is a coercion actually, but it finds that, uh, ah yes, and, and we have already implemented the conversion, and because Sage knows if there is a coercion, it will use this conversion as a coercion. This is what it Okay, what has happened in this line? Um, there is an integer one, and there's a matrix. And Sage will take the parents of these two objects, so in other words, the integer ring and our matrix space, and it will see, okay, there is a coercion from the integers to our matrix space not in the other direction apparently. So it would take the number one, would coerce it into the matrix space, giving a diagonal matrix, yeah, and add the two matrices. So this is the result. Um, okay, so this was something that was uh, due to the, uh, to the category framework. So the existence of a coercion from the base ring is something that we can take for granted if we have an algebra only. Um, but in other cases, uh, we need to do uh, something more. Namely, we need to tell Sage, please use this conversion as a coercion. How to do it? Well, we implement an other, met uh, an other method, single underscore coerce map from, uh, for our parent structure. So it takes one other parent as an argument. So, and it re should return true if Sage is supposed to use a conversion from P to self. It should return false if there is definitely no uh, coercion from P to self. It should return none, in other words, nothing, if, uh, yeah, if Sage uh, should try to find by itself to find a coercion. Or it is also possible to return a map. <coughs> if you return a map, then this map is used as a coercion. Okay, let's try it refresh it. And now, because of this uh, coerce map from method, 
we now find that there is a coercion from Sage's matrix space to our matrix space. So simply it takes the conversion up as a coercion. And now we can multiply the two. And the result lives in our implementation because Sage now knows there is a coercion from this one to that one, but uh, it does not know about the opposite way. I mean, mathematically, there should be also the opposite way, but Sage only knows about one way, so the result lives on the left, left side. And also, you can do the addition by the same thing. So, now for something more complicated and actually more about categories in a mathematical sense, not about category framework. Okay. Um, the push out construction. Uh, so the uh, yeah the basic example is uh, you want to add polynomial over the integers with a rational number, and the result is then neither a rational number nor a polynomial over the integers. This is something new, namely polynomial over the rationals. So how does this work? How is this implemented? Well, uh, many parents in Sage can tell how they were constructed. For example, we have this matrix space here. In the construction, well, the, there's a method called construction, returning two items, <coughs> namely a ring to start with, R, which is an integer ring, and then there's something here in this case called matrix functor. So in other words, the matrix functor is a functor that takes any ring and converts it into, in this case, matrix space uh, with two columns and two rows. So if you apply this functor, to the base ring, then you recover the original ring, but you could also apply the same functor to a different base ring, for example, to the to some polynomial ring, and you would again get a matrix space in Sage's implementation, of course, um, over the univariate polynomial ring. So, so and this is called a construction functor. So, what is this? Uh, first of all, it is a covariant functor from one category to, the, to another. Here in our example, we have a, uh, a functor from the category of rings to the category of modules, if it is non-square, or to the category of algebras, if it is square matrices. Um, and there must be some condition related with the coercion. Namely, if you take any coercion from P to Q and apply the functor, then you should again obtain a coercion from f of p to f of q, f of q. And typical examples in stages of such construction function, uh, functors are the construction of a matrix space, we have just seen it, the construction of a polynomial ring, construction of a, fraction, of a fraction field, and the construction of the algebraic closer. So demonstrated, so this is a uh, construction of a polynomial ring. Uh, it takes a ring and returns a ring, a polynomial ring. Um, here you have the fraction field construction. It takes any integral domain and returns a field. Fraction, a fraction field. It's a special category of fraction fields. It's strange, but anyway. Uh, and here for the algebraic closure, you take any ring, in this case the rational field, and then the algebraic closure is q cubed r. This is the ring of algebraic numbers. Yeah, often there is a coercion from some ring to f of this ring, but not always. Here's a counterexample. There is no coercion from a rectangular matrix, uh, so, uh, sorry, there's no coercion from the base ring to a rectangular matrix space. So this matrix space is obtained by uh, applying some matrix functor to that, but it is not square, otherwise you don't have a coercion. But very often you have a coercion from the, uh, the ring you started with to the image ring. And every construction functor has a rank. This is some technical detail that helps Sage to discover new arithmetic structures. So how are these construction functors used in the, in the coercion framework? Well, you have two parts, P1 and P2, and they are obtained from some common ancestor, typically from the ring of integers, by two sequences of construction functors. For example, you first uh, uh, take the fraction field, then you apply the matrix functor, 
then apply a polynomial ring, and then apply again a fraction theorem. So, so we have a sequence of constructions leading to P1 and P2 from a common ancestor. And in order to, uh, uh, to do arithmetic between P1 and P2, Sage would take these two sequences and shuffle them. So it would try to find a reasonable order in which to apply all these functors. Okay, and this is where we need the rank of these functors. Namely, Sage would, uh, if it has a choice to apply uh, from the sequence leading to P1 or to the uh, sequence leading to P2, then it would always take the one that has the lowest rank. Um. Okay, yeah, so here's an example giving you two sequences of uh, applying two construction functors to that, namely first fraction field and then uh, the full matrix space. And here, first construct a polynomial ring over the integers and then construct a matrix space. And what should happen in the push out? Well, Sage would of course start with the ring of integers and then it would find, okay, the next to apply is either the polynomial ring uh, functor or the fraction field functor. And it looks up the rank. Okay, the fraction field functor has a lower rank than the polynomial ring functor. And so we would first apply the fraction field functor. So in other words, we would first form the fraction field of that, which really yields the, the Russian field. Yeah, and afterwards, the polynomial ring functor is applied. And then we are in the situation where on both sides we have the same functor. Well, there's no choice. We simply apply this functor. So the result should be first apply the fraction field functor, then the polynomial ring functor, and then this matrix functor. And indeed, this is what we obtain. We start with the ring of integers, that's the fraction field, we obtain the rational field. Uh, then, we opt uh, then we apply the polynomial ring factor, uh, obtain the univariate polynomial ring in X over the rational field, and then apply matrix functor. So this is how this push out construction in stage works. Of course, of course push out is another notion from category theory. Um, and there might be one clash, namely, it might be, uh, there might be a situation where you have two different functors that you both would like to apply, um, and they have the same rank, so you don't know which one to apply first. So there are two situations how to break this tie. Um, you could tell Sage that these two functors commute. In this situation, Sage would apply both functors on both sides uh, in any order because the order does not matter if they commute. Um, but another uh, uh, way to resolve this clash is to say, uh, to tell Sage how to merge these two functors. And this is a situation that typically occurs if you have two implementation of the same arithmetic structure. You have one functor for, for the one implementation, another functor for the other implementation. These functors are, diff of course, different because they use different implementation but they should have the same rank. And then the merge of these two functors should be some default implementation of this arithmetic structure. So we do this here. We create our <coughs> own matrix functor. We inherit from the existing matrix functor. In other words, uh, we have the same rank. Um, in order to apply a functor, one should provide uh, this method underscore apply functor. So it takes any ring and applies our matrix field construction. And here's the merge. So we would only merge uh, two matrix functors with each other. So this matrix functor could be either one from Sage or one of our matrix functors. Uh, we would only merge if the number of rows and the number of columns coincides. And if it does, then we return our matrix field, con uh, our, our matrix ring construction, and not stages one. So this is how to choose a default implementation of matrix space. So we refresh our uh, definition of matrix spaces. We add a method that tells how this ring is constructed. Refresh it, and we see the uh, applying the construction works. And now we can ask it for the push out. So we can uh, 
Mountain Saint is not required. We didn't promote it to the cell before the last one. Before before. Oh, no. Ah, yes, here, okay. Yes, okay, we have here. Um, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, mm -hmm, thank you. Uh, we have here a matrix space over some polynomial ring. Of course, there is no coercion map from this uh, uh, matrix space over the polynomial ring, simply because the polynomial ring does not coerce in our base ring, which is the, ring of, uh, in, uh, the, uh, the, the field of uh, rationality. And of course, there's also no uh, coercion in the other way, because simply Sage does not know enough about our implementation. We just implemented it here. So there's no coercion. Um, but there's a push out. Namely, Sage, no, uh, Sage was told how to construct the two matrix spaces. And by merging them, our implementation was chosen for the push out. So, and yeah, we can create a matrix in this uh, polynomial uh, or in this matrix space implemented in the Sage way, and we can add it to a matrix implemented in our way, and we see it works. Our original matrices were defined over the rationals, Sages defined over some polynomial ring, and the result is uh, yeah defined over some polynomial ring with rational coefficients. Okay, so this is the push out. I think this was the technically most difficult part, I would say. Um, now actions. So actions can of course be fairly uh, general. Um, Sage would actually not check uh, that the mathematical properties of an action like uh, the idea that a group act on something, then there must be some compatibility and so on. Sage uh, would not check these, so it is your job to make sure that it really holds. Um, but I only tell you how to implement such actions. And one way is to uh, to define a method called underscore acted upon. So what does this method do? You see here the default implementation. Use this method to implement self acted on by some other element. Return none or raise a coercion exception if no such action is defined here. So the default is there is no action defined here. But we can define it. So what would be a good example? Um, I chose the following example. We have a permutation, and we want to say if uh, 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 that a permutation multiplied with our matrix simply would return a matrix with permuted rows. Huh? So this makes sense for permutation. So this shall happen here. We implement acted upon. X shall be uh, some permutation. It shall be on the left. If it's not on, uh, uh, although if uh, self is on the left and not the permutation is on the left, then there is no action, so we return none. And otherwise, we simply assume, while well, the permutation is callable, we simply assume that it is callable and uh, yeah, apply it here to permute the rows. Evaluate it. Create a matrix. Here's the matrix. It's simply a diagonal matrix. Create a permutation. Arc. And someone has killed Sage's category, uh, Sage's, oh, coercion framework, it should be here. Sage's coercion framework. Um, by overloading the, the, uh, the magical underscore, uh, uh, magical double underscore multiplication method. So you see um, what happens if you do so. Namely, there's, a, there's an error. We have implemented this fancy acted upon method, but still Sage does not know how to act. And here's the reason. Someone has overridden uh, the un double underscore multiplication method, so he has nothing about the coercion framework anymore. It simply knows how to multiply permutation. So please don't do this. It causes trouble for other people. Um, so instead, well, permutation will not work for our example, uh, where we can transform or we can uh, instead use an element of the symmetric group, which is also a kind of permutation, if you like. So, and this was implemented in a uh, way that fits better with the coercion framework. And now we can multiply. So we take an element of the symmetric group, which uh, permutes 2 and 3. And in fact, the rows 2 and 3, well, counting starts with 0, uh, the rows 2 and 3 are permuted. So this is what we wanted. We also wanted that there's only a, um, a permutation action from the left, 
but not from the right. So if we try it from the right, then there will be an error, which is good. We wanted that this error happens. Um, yeah, and uh, Sage actually has a notion of an action. So it is not the case that it would always try to look up, okay, is there this acted upon method, which takes time. I mean, look up a method takes time. Uh, instead, it would uh, say, okay, it has worked once, acted upon did work, so we assume it will always work. And uh, here's another method, get action, that is implemented for all parents. And uh, <coughs> yeah, we want to know what action exists from the, the symmetric group, where the symmetric group, group is on the left, on our market space. So this action is in fact called left action by symmetric group of order uh, four factorial or the permutation group, blah, blah, on our matrix space. And there's a special type for this type of action, namely the acted upon action. So this acted upon action knows, okay, it is guaranteed that the elements have this method acted upon and will use it. So this is one potential way <coughs> to implement uh, an action. But in some cases one has several actions. And it is of course difficult to, well, uh, in our definition here, whatever in acted upon, where is it? Here. We could of course then test, well, if x is a permutation, then do this. If x is a polynomial, then do something else. If x is whatever, then do a third thing. This would be very complicated, and it is a better idea instead um, to uh, let the parent decide what the action should be like. So, and there's a base class for uh, actions defined in sage.categories.action. So this defines all kinds of, uh, so you, if you want to define a new action, then you should inherit it from it. We will use an action for multiplication of rectangular matrices. I mean, before we were able to uh, multiply square matrices because they are within one ring. But now we have uh, matrices that belong to different parents, namely to, say, two by four matrices and four by two matrices, which is different. <coughs> so how to define an action? Well, one should tell whether uh, the thing that acts is on the left side or on the right side, what operator it should be for. So we want that it uh, belongs to the multiplication operator. It's also possible to say, okay, we want that this works for the addition operator or for the, I don't know, exponentiation should exist or well, no idea. Um, so what should we do? Um, P1 and P2 is supposed to be uh, any matrix space. So matrix space is a base. Um, the, uh, so this, this will be the coefficient of this matrix space. Um, we apply the push out in order to find a, uh, um, a field of coefficients that fits better. And of course, if we want to multiply, then the number of rows and uh, the number of columns of the result is then termed by the input. Yeah. And here's something that uh, simply says over what will we need to add if we multiply the thing. So, and again, please do not overwrite um, double underscore call. Please make it single underscore. So, and here's implementation of matrix multiplication. So, and what will we do on the level of the fund? So this is how to implement an action. And now how to use this action. In the parent, we have another single underscore method, namely get action. We have seen a, a get action method without underscores. This is different now. Uh, so this is single underscore get action. Again, it takes another parent, <coughs> which is supposed to act. An operator, multiplication, addition, whatever and it tells whether self is on the left or on the right side. Okay, and we want matrix multiplication, so if there is no matrix multiplication, so this is addition or something else, then simply we uh, do what modules would be. Uh, we don't do anything special for this. Um, otherwise, we try whether P, this other parent, looks like a matrix space. Well, a matrix space has number of columns, has number of rows, if it does not have these methods, so if there's an attribute error, then we know it is not matrix space. We know we don't know about anything that is not matrix space, so we simply uh, let module do the work 
because there's some other action that module knows about. If self is on the left, then we need to check that the number of columns of self and the number of rows of the other thing coincides, because only in this situation we can multiply. If this fits, then we return our matrix action. If it does not fit, then again we defer to the uh, to the default inherited from the module. Yeah, and if self is on not on the left, then simply the two the things need to exchange the rows. <coughs> now we define matrices two by four matrices and four by two matrices in our implementation, and we get the action. And indeed, there's a left multiplication action. So this is something that we define here. A left multiplication action or matrix. Um, some notion about caching. Um, this get action method would return always a new instance of this matrix action. It is not needed to cache it here because the coercion framework of Sage would cache it for you. So no need to do it explicitly. So there's this left multiplication action. And in fact, it is able to interrelate our matrix implementation with Sage's mat uh, matrix implementation. So what is happening here? We have a matrix in our implementation, 2 by 4, in our implementation, 4 by 2, in Sage's implementation, 2 by 4, and in Sage's implementation, 4 by 2, with the same entries. We can, of course, or maybe not of course, because this is new, we can multiply our rectangular matrices simply because we have this left multiplication action, and this left multiplication action is then called on these two matrices. We check that our result is uh, fine. I mean, this is the result that Sage returns. It is apparently the same up to the comma here. Um, and now comes something good. We can even mix our implementation, this one here, with Sage's implementation. Hmm, why is this? Well, this is something that uh, Volker did not mention. Very often in Python, one uses duck typing. Duck typing means, uh, how would it you describe the animal duck? A duck is something that can swim, something that can quack and can fly, and maybe some other properties. So, in other words, if we have anything that we don't know, and we simply test, can it swim, can it fly, can it quack? <laughs> if it can, then we assume it is a duck and maybe eat it or whatever. Um, so we do here the same. Um, we duct type matrix spaces, so we test if it has number of columns. We test if it, if it has number of rows. Somewhere here, I think, we also test if it has, has a date. And if it has these three things, then for us, it behaves like a matrix space. And this is good, because both Sage's matrix spaces and our matrix spaces pass this test. In other words, here if P is a Sage matrix, matrix space, then it would work, it would eventually return our matrix action. If P is our matrix space, then it would again pass the test and return our matrix action. Yeah, and it works on both sides because Sage's coercion framework would first try with self on the left and then with self on the right. So it both works if the Sage matrix is on the left or the Sage matrix is on the right. In all cases, we would return something which is our implementation of a matrix. So this was about duct typing. Uh, simply for uh, compatibility, we checked that the old stuff still works. I mean, after all, we have here overridden something called get action. It could be that we destroyed something. Well, I took care of it, because in all cases where duct typing did not reveal a matrix space, then we say, OK, please do the same what module would do. So in other words, if we have an action of the base ring, here, if we have an action of the base ring, then the, uh, it would still be recognized because this is something that the module knows about. <coughs> from the left, from the right. And also this uh, thing with acted upon, I mean here, in this default get action here, it, it would also be checked if there is this acted upon method, it would still be recognized. In other words, we can still apply the permutation to the node rows. So this was about different ways to implement actions and so on and so on. Thank you.
So is this like coercion or sort of paradigm? Is this present in any other language? Or um, you yes, 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 yes. Uh, something actually that I forgot to mention, I was talking about uh, it on lunch and forgot to mention it here. Um, there is a notion of coercion in C, uh, in the programming language C. That is about type conversion, mm -hmm. or automatic type conversion. There's one C type for integers, there's one C type for floats, and if you add an integer and a float, then the integer would be coerced into the type of floats and then added. This is here a bit different. Here it is about conversion of different parents, also into different parents. It can very well be that the type does not change, so the Python type can be the same, even though it represents elements of different parents. This can happen. But it can also happen that, well, it rarely occurs, but it is possible, that you have one parent whose elements are implemented in different types. It's not recommended, but would in principle work. So this is one uh, difference to the C programming language. In Sage, it is about conversion into a different parent structure. In C, it is a conversion in different types. And it is a conversion that happens automatically. This is both in C and in, in Sage. And also there is a similar coercion framework in Magma. If I'm not mistaken, it was originally inspired by what happens in Magma. But in Magma, it's always forced, right? Hmm? Don't you usually have to force the conversions in Magma? Oh, well, I'm, I'm not using Magma myself. I was told that the original version of Sage's coercion framework comes from this, comes from Magma. And I would actually expect that Magma knows how to add one and one out. It does. So the category of framework came from a uh, combinat uh, Nepal. I think this is from combinat. At least uh, the people that are most active in the category framework, like Nicola Thierry and so on, they are uh, they come from Mupat, say combinat and so on. But I just mean that the uh, correction is sort of based on category framework. It, it, it is, it's not based on. I mean, uh, it predates the category framework. I would say, but in order to really formulate in a mathematical way. Uh, like what is coercion function? Uh, what what is a construction function and so on? And that uh, coercion map must always be an um, amorphism in some category. Uh, so you need the mathematical notion of a category. But for this to make it work, you do not necessarily need the category framework. I mean, category framework. It is more about uh, well the fact that your parent structure is an algebra, not just a module. It means that it has additional methods that are available. For example, in a module, you would not necessarily have a one element. You have a zero element, but not a one element. In an algebra, you have. And in this case, the category framework might provide a default implementation that returns a unit element. So it adds more methods to what uh, you have implemented. It is something like an additional base class. From, uh, and there was some discussion also with Volker, I think, about uh, this topic uh, anyway. So I see it this way that um, by the co uh, category framework you inherit additional useful stuff. Um, and you implement one class that uh, can solve both for implementing an algebra and a module and whatever ring of. So. And, this and the ca uh, co category framework also provides what I find quite useful tests. So not only default implementations of some uh, algebraic stuff, but also tests. You can test, have I forgotten something? For example, uh, the test suite thing. Yeah, this is the test suite thing. Yeah. I don't dare to uh, to now uh, test whether my matrix implementation passes this test, so I actually did not, should have maybe. Um, as a for example, for uh, as a if something is in the category of uh, associative magmas, then it would simply test is it really associative? So you, your job would be to provide a method that returns some elements. Well, in order to make the test really good, you should return at least three different elements. And then the test suite would take these three elements and test the law of associativity on these three samples. You know, you see why it would be a good idea to return three different elements. No? Um, so anyway, so these are tests that the category framework would automatically perform, or maybe uh, also for some. Yeah, it is it is good to not always reinvent the wheel, and 
there are certain conventions uh, that are used in SAGE and these tests can also be used to enforce these kind of convention conventions. For example, uh, an element of a fraction field should provide a method denominator and numerator. Mm -hmm. And the category framework actually asks if, uh, other asks for the presence of some such methods. So if you <coughs> forgot to implement these or gave it a different name or something, then the category framework would complain if you run the test here. Uh, is it also possible to automatically detect uh, violation of this convention that uh, you have defined uh, double underscore mm -hmm. x, for example? Oh, uh, well, I don't know. This, this would, uh, would be maybe a little crazy idea. You mean something like uh, you have uh, defined a double underscore and then the category framework would uh, tell, okay, please implement single underscore and stack yeah. or so. Something like well, something like this, yes. Other, for example, in the... Okay. Um, wait. Uh, uh, sorry, I might have forgotten what 